Welcome everybody tonight, and we'll get right to Dr. Coldfarber in just a minute. I want to welcome everybody tonight to tonight's webinar. I'm Dr. Gary Severance, Executive Leader of Professional Services for Henry Schein. Uh, tonight, Heidi Coldfarber, Farber, sorry, is our presenter tonight, and she's just getting her presentation up and running. She's the owner and managing oral and maxillofacial radiologist for Dental Radiology Diagnostics. She's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Diagnostic Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition to her dental degree, she's got a master's in oral and maxillofacial radiology and a PhD in diagnostic images. So uh, we're very excited about all the information she'll provide. Now today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive a link of the recording in the next week's, week, so you can always refer back to it. If you have any questions tonight, please use the Q&A, and after the program, we'll have Dr. Cole Farber respond directly to them as well, as time permits. Uh, this pr uh, webinar is being presented by Henry Schein. There is no CE credits for it and uh, for either viewing or attending this, but we certainly welcome Dr. Cole Farber here. With that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, doctor. Yep. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, my apologies on being a little bit late. We had a little bit more drama than I had anticipated today with um, a little bit of internet uh, problems, of course, right? That's like Murphy's Law. But um, anyway, I just really want to thank you. I want to thank Henry Shine for letting me be here today. And what we're talking about, I'm very excited today to talk about Axios. But we're also talking about applications for expansion in our dental offices. And so it's kind of a huge topic. Um, easily, you know, any of our applications could take days and some people spend years studying those, but uh, we'll try to wrap it up pretty quickly. So a couple of things that we're gonna talk about. First of all, coming CT and how does it work? What factors should you consider if you're thinking about purchasing a CBCT? And the one feature today will be Axios, which I think many of us have been waiting for for a very, very long time. And then we're going to show it in some various applications, so such as implants, endo, ortho, and airway, which, as I said, each of those areas is a huge, huge area. So I'll try to do it justice in an hour. So the first thing I want to talk about is where have we been? So kind of give us a little bit of history about where we've been to understand where we are and where we're going. So of course, as we all know, x-rays were discovered in about November of 1895. By January of 1896, we as dentists had already figured out how to jump on this train. Uh, we, we saw the promise in this technology as we have done many, many times. Many times we are on the forefront of all the technology and we could see how it could be used in our dental offices. So this is the very first radiograph. It's a bite wing that took about 30 minutes um, to take. And this was done in January of 1896. So really only took us, you know, like I said, two months to figure out how we could utilize this. Then we have down here, we have an old uh, 1920s unit. And this right here is a live wire. That's 70,000 volts to the patient if they were to accidentally pick up their hand and touch that. So of course, a lot of issues as far as liability goes. But nowadays we can take our x-rays in a fraction of a second and our machines are a whole lot safer. But we are still using that same geometry for our 2D images from 1896. Now they have improved extensively, and I do want to mention that. We have some very impressive 2D enhancements. Uh, this is the Schick AE with some of the filtering enhancements that it has. Obviously, this looks a whole lot better than 1896. The next innovation that came was our panoramic imaging. This was in the 1950s. And the interesting thing with this is that all of the x-ray equipment was stationary and the patient actually spun around. So talk about people getting sick in your chair. And of course, our x-rays have come a long way, our panoramics have come a long way as well. So this is Axios. This is the 2D direct conversion sensor, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, it takes out that intermediate step of going to light first 
And so we have a gorgeous image with that. In fact, um, they can actually um, take multiple images at once and then it will choose the image that is most aligned with that focal trough, which is really great. We don't have to worry about our patient being in exactly the perfect spot anymore. And as you can see, we don't have a lot of those ghosting artifacts that we had before. So I would say panoramic imaging has come a very, very long way. Another thing that we might have as far as 2D imaging is the Axios can be purchased with a Ceph unit. And so you can have a AP and a lateral Ceph. Actually, it's a PA and a lateral Ceph. And you, the other thing that you can do is you can take hand x-rays with it. So if you want to evaluate the skeletal age of a patient, you can easily do that with this technology. And the really cool thing is that with Axios, you know, whether you're looking at a PAN or a Ceph or the Comium CT, they all have um, their own distinct uh, receptors or, that go with them. So I think that's one, one of the really, really cool things. All right, so what is the issue with our 2D imaging? Well, obviously this is a shocking picture. Like, oh my goodness, how could she put this in here? But it brings home the fact that we don't have the truth when we're looking at 2D. We really need to see the 3D perspective. And so if we look at the other perspective, look from the front, we can see that Prince William, who's super nice, is really saying, I now have three children. So you matter of perspective is very, very important. And of course, these images you've probably seen before, they were all over the news. And I think probably every radiologist picked these up as a fantastic example of the fact that one 2D image does not tell us the truth. We need multiple angles to it. So we're talking about our Comium CT. It's really a combination of three different technologies. We have our image intensifiers or flat panel detectors, similar to our fluoroscopy units. We use the algorithm for medical CT, which is actually pretty phenomenal. And the really cool thing is that it all can fit onto a panoramic platform that fits into our dental office. All right. So this is our beautiful images from Axios, which is very exciting to see. What are the main advantages of Combeam CT? Well, diagnosis and treatment planning. Definitely, it becomes the foundation for digital dentistry. So there's so much that we can do with it. And of course, this is excellent for patient education. So what does this look like? Well, as it's rotating around our patient, it's taking multiple basis projections. It's taking about a thousand images in about 16 seconds for the largest field of view. And the really neat thing with Axios is it actually rotates twice around the patient's head uh, for the large field of view, which um, was incredibly innovative. And I think it's one of the things that helped it to win the Red Dot Award which is very cool. All right, what other factors should be considered when we are purchasing a CBCT? So I think one of the most important things if you're thinking about a CBCT system is what are you gonna be using it for? Um, clearly that's one of the most important things and that helps us decide what field of view and resolutions are needed for that particular task. And I would say one of the really nice things with Axios is that we have multiple fields of view and multiple resolutions. So it really becomes an all-in-one unit for us. Is the software intuitive and easy to use? And definitely I would play with the software if you're interested in it. Um, it is ridiculously easy to use. So I'll show you some of the stuff that I put together just in playing with this uh, new machine that I was really excited about. And it didn't take me very much time to figure out. Um, what type of support is offered by the manufacturer? Again, very, very important. You want to make sure that you have somebody that you can pick up the phone and call and talk to. Um, you want somebody to be right there for you. So these are some of our representative fields of view. Um, we have our large, 17 by 13, but it costs you an 11 by 10, an 8 by 8, and a small a uh, localized field of view that's a five by five. Now there are additional fields of view available. So there's really just amazing things that you can do with this particular unit. So, you know, if you want an eight by five, five you can do that. Um, if you want an 11 by eight, you can do that. So 
you know, it really puts it into your hands as far as your field of view and the location that you want to image. And I think that's one of the really, really cool things. Um, now, the um, we're looking at our resolution with this. The resolution will vary between about 80 microns for the five by five to about 220 microns for the large field of view. So this is what the 17 by 13 centimeter field of view looks like. Um, this is in the software. I've had a lot of questions the last couple of weeks. Um, I think that you know maybe some of the reps have too that you know what can we do with this? Are we can we see the condyles? Yes, absolutely. We can see the condyles with this. Is it going to work for ortho? Yes, you can see all the points that you need for ortho. This is fantastic. Um, what about cervical spine? Perhaps we want to look at the skeletal age based on the cervical spine. And yes, we can do that. So if we're looking at this one, we're seeing down to about C4, C5, the junction of C4, C5. Can we do airway with it? Absolutely, you can definitely see the airway. So you really can do everything with this that you would want with a large field of view. The next field of view, of course, is our 11 by 10. This is great if we just want to get the airway. Maybe we don't need the whole large field of view. Uh, so it works very, very nicely for that. And of course, maxillin mandible. And then maybe we just want to use it for implants. Maybe we're just wanting to take, you know, maxillin mandible eight by eight. Absolutely. Easily can do that. Or maybe we want that high resolution five by five um, centimeters at about 80 microns. And absolutely, you can do that too. So I think that that's one of the most amazing things with this is that you know you can use it everything from you know for your for you know looking at your canals and that sort of things for endo to hey I'd like to start doing some ortho in my office. So you have so many options and I think that this particular machine is one that many of us were looking forward to or waiting for and it definitely did not disappoint. All right, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about radiation risks because you can't have more fun than radiation dosimetry. So let's talk about that because, of course, our patients are concerned about it. So when we're talking about our coming CTs, we know that the dose can vary quite widely depending on the machine, the volume, the detector type, um, the voxel size, our, our image resolution, and the number of projections. So on average, it's less than conventional medical CT. So when we are looking at dose, you know, it helps to have some type of a background to think about dose. One of the things that we want to talk about is the effective dose, because that takes into account the volume as well as the sensitivity of the tissues to ionizing radiation. And we want to use our latest tissue weights, which the latest tissue weights are the 2007 tissue weights. And that is a weighting factor based on um, studies uh, with, um, you know, atomic bomb survivors, animal studies or accidents, that sort of thing, to look at how sensitive those tissues are to ionizing radiation. And then each of those tissues is given a particular factor. So we're looking at any type of machine. We always want to compare the effective dose. So when we're looking at the large field of view, we can see it varies quite widely between 46 to up over 1,000 microsieverts. So there's a huge variability. But when we look at all the protocols on the market, the average for a large field of view is 212 microsieverts. The medium field of view varies between 9 to 560. And the average for medium field of view is 177 microsieverts. And then this small field of view varies between 5 to 652. And on average, it's 84 microsieverts. So we can say the smaller the field of view, the less dose. But we know that there's always some outliers to that. Notice that your small field of view can go up to 652 microsieverts, which would be more than a medium field of view. So there's always some variability in there. But on the average, the smaller the field of view, the less dose. So how does our Axios stack up to that? Well, when we are looking at our small field of view, these are all in high definition. So we pick the highest um, dose. We can say that it is about 74 
microsieverts. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we can compare that to days of being alive. Um, we call that days of per capita background radiation. And in the United States, you receive about 8.2 microsieverts just being alive on the earth. So we can say that the five by five is the equivalent to about nine days of being alive on the earth. The eight by eight is equivalent to 15 days of being alive on the earth. The 11 by 10 is the equivalent of 20 days. And if we're looking at the largest field of view, the 17 by 13, it is 171 microsieverts or the equivalent of 21 days of being alive on the earth. Now, I do want to mention because there is a low dose option and I'll show uh, some images as well, but the low dose for the largest field of view will vary between 13 to 28 microsieverts, depending on the protocol that's chosen, whether you're choosing for uh, peds or a large adult. Uh, why is that special for us? Well, the dose for a panoramic is approximately 14.2 microsieverts. So with the large field of view, and if you use the low dose protocols, you're able to take a Combium CT for the equivalent dose of one to two pans, which is just unbelievable. Um, so that is really, really amazing. So how does this compare with other things we might do in dentistry? So this is Axios, this is the eight by eight average adult, and that's about equivalent to six to seven panoramic um, radiographs. It is only a third of a film-based full mouth series. So those old film-based full mouth series were quite a lot of dose. Um, so this is only a third of that. And it's just slightly more than a digital full mouth series or the equivalent of our 15 days of background radiation. Now, what are the chance of in utero birth defects with this? It's absolutely zero. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So when we're talking about ionizing radiation, there's actually two different effects. There's a stochastic effect and there's a deterministic effect. The stochastic effect is based on statistics. And the effect, this is the effect where the risk is proportional to the dose. So that implies that there is no threshold. So the current thought process is that the damage from ionizing radiation slowly accumulates over time. And at some point, the body may not be able to repair that damage and you might get a cancer or some type of mutation starting. Now the severity of the effect is independent of the dose. So for instance, if Mrs. Jones were diagnosed with stage four cancer does not necessarily mean she had more dose. Just means that at some point, something caused the cancer to begin. Then we have our deterministic effects. And with this one, the severity is proportional to the dose. And we have a defined threshold. So we know that over X amount of radiation, this particular event will happen. And under that, it will not happen. So examples of that might be um, radiation burns. Uh, we have our in utero birth defects or radiation cataracts, which do look different than senility cataracts. Um, we have sunburn up there, not because we want to equate an x-ray with a day in the sun, we do not, but a sunburn is a deterministic effect. So for example, if you were to spend 15 minutes outside in the sun, you probably won't get a sunburn. If you spend four hours outside in the sun, you'll probably get a sunburn. And so it's a time dependent deterministic effect. Now, one of the things that we have found is that the dose threshold for birth defects, for in utero birth defects is between 100 to 250 millisieverts. Now, remember in dentistry, we've been talking about microsieverts. So this is orders, in fact, what we do is orders of magnitude below whether you, where you would ever have this type of effect. And so that's why we can say without a shadow of a doubt, there's absolutely zero chance of in utero birth defects with anything that we do in dentistry. All right, so let's show some of those low dose protocols. So this was a case for wisdom teeth, 22 year old male. This is the 11 by 10 field of view. And the effective dose for this was 19 microsieverts. So we can definitely see where the um, mandibular canal is in relationship to that tooth. 
It's another one taken for implants. Um, this one again, 11 by 10. This one was taken at nine microsieverts. Remember I said a pan was 14. So this is less than a pan. If we're looking at a set of bite wings, that's about five microsieverts. So this is a, just a little bit more than our set of bite wings. We can definitely see where that mandibular canal is in relationship to the implant. Uh, this is used for orthodontics, which I think is a great use of the low dose protocols. Uh, this is an eight by eight field of view. They want to be able to visualize the canine, uh, see what's going on with that particular tooth. And this is eight microsieverts. So less than a pan, a little bit more than bite wings, and we have all the 3D capabilities. And this one's pretty phenomenal. Again, it's um, for orthodontic purposes. This is the five by five. And they want to know what is going on with our impacted canine. They were able to take this with three microsieverts. And of course, you have all the capabilities of our 3D imaging. So really quite remarkable. All right, most important component of a coming CT system is always your support team. That's very, very important. You wanna make sure your manufacturer is behind you. You've got your technical support um, for all your maintenance or upgrades, but also for education, because we know that ethically and legally, the entire scan volume should be looked at. We wanna be able to recognize abnormal and refer appropriately. And free training is offered by CEREC doctors, which is really fantastic. So they have some um, great offerings there. And there's always oral maxillofacial radiologists like myself that are happy to help you. In fact, we do have a plugin um, that Serona put together for us that you can download. And it will actually go into the output section of the software. So if there's ever a case that you're not sure what you're looking at, you can always click on our little DRDX easy button and it will go directly to a radiologist to be reviewed. So the cool thing with this is you're never alone. There's always somebody there to help you, which is something that I really like, especially when you're out in practice, you know, by yourself. All right, let's talk about some of the applications. There's a ton of applications. Um, I was asked to really tailor it towards implants, endo, ortho, and airway, which as I said by themselves is such a big area, um, but definitely exciting to be able to talk about those. Of course, implants being the driving force behind this technology, that's why this technology was brought into dentistry. But you can also see developmental abnormalities, third molar and canal relationships, um, periapical periodontal findings, uh, temporal mandibular joint imaging, which is a spot that I really love. Uh, trauma, absolutely. We don't have all those 2D superimpositions. Pathological findings, yes. Um, as one of our professors used to tell us, you may not see pathology in your practice, but pathology will see you. So we definitely want to catch those. And the little secret is it's actually easier to find them in 3D than it ever was in 2D. Airway and sleep apnea applications, definitely. And of course, orthodontic applications. And of course you can do 3D segmentation. So we'll talk about some of these. One of the things we do wanna keep in mind when we're looking between 2D versus 3D is that 2D consistently underestimates the bone loss and overestimates the bone gain. And we see that time and time again. And a lot of people will ask us, well, when do I move between 2D and 3D? How do I know when it's time to go to 3D? Well, any time that 2D does not give you enough information, it is time to move to 3D. So let's start talking about our implants, because I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of us get this technology. Um, I'll start off with the position statement of the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology in conjunction with dental implantology. And it recommends that cross-sectional imaging be used for the assessment of all dental implant sites and that coming CT is the imaging method of choice for gaining this information. So what type of information would we get from taking with our CBCT? Well, we can have improved diagnosis, optimum implant selection. Uh, we can avoid any surgical surprises. And many times um, as we are helping on some of the legal cases, we see that if something goes wrong, they take a coming CT 100% of the time after the fact. So it's smart just to take it right from the get-go, 
take it before anything goes wrong, we can avoid all those surgical surprises. Um, becomes the basis for guided surgery, uh, which is fantastic. And it's great for medical legal documentation. Um, if anything goes wrong, as I said, they always wanna go back and see, well, what did the Comium CT look like? Um, in fact, we have had uh, some insurance companies that will tell us that if a Comium CT was not taken in advance and something went wrong, the doctor is not defendable. Now, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, that definitely does not come from us as radiologists, uh, but that's what we're being told. And so that's interesting that that's out there. So just be smart, take it ahead of time. So of course, with our coming CT, we know that we have our multiplanar reconstructed images. What does that mean? It means that we have images in the axial section, which as our little guy shows us right here is basically from the top down, or you can think about bottoms up as well. Um, coronal goes from front to back and sagittal goes from side to side. And of course, it's really nice because you have a little skull view or a 3D view, our little volume rendering that will show us exactly what we're, where we're at as we go through our software. So of course, there's a whole bunch of areas that would be of anatomical concern if we are placing implants. So let's go ahead and go through some of them. Oh, and I had to add this. Um, this is when your anatomy class is now on Zoom. So <laughs> this is the anatomy class of Dr. Nicholas Tulip by Rembrandt from the 1600s. And uh, somebody redid the whole image in a Zoom class, which I thought was very appropriate for the times right now. So definitely wanted to share that. All right, so when we're looking, we're gonna start with um, neurovasculature of the maxilla. We definitely have the incisive canal. We all know it's there. Um, we can measure it if we want to, but we also see accidents such as this, as we can see there's an implant sitting in the middle of the incisive canal. So of course the patient's gonna have some post-operative issues with that. Again, another reason why having three dimensions is very nice when we are planning our implants. We have a lot of neurovasculature that we're not used to seeing, that we were not used to seeing on 2D but we can definitely see it on 3D. And one of them is the anterior superior alveolar neurovascular canal. And this is going to extend inferiorly. Um, usually it's around the canine lateral region. Uh, you can see there is some variation in the location. This one is actually between um, the lateral and the anterior incisor. And you can see how large this one is as well. So definitely if our implant was placed within that canal, we're gonna have some post-operative issues. And according to the research, um, many of the times when patient had anterior post-operative neurosensory deficits, it was because that implant was placed within a large anterior superior alveolar neurovascular canal. So it's really nice with uh, 3D to be able to see it and avoid that. We also have the posterior superior alveolar neurovascular canal, and this extends anteriorly along the lateral aspect of the sinuses, and it's going to anastomose with branches from the infraorbital artery. Now we can see exactly where it's located in 3D. Why would this be a concern? Well, if you're going to do any type of sinus lift and bone grafting, you would want to avoid it. Um, if you were to nick that, not only could you get some little neurosensory deficits, but it's going to cause a lot of bleeding. And so you wanna make sure that you avoid cutting that when you are doing a sinus lift and bone graft. <clears throat> the other thing that we wanna be careful of, of is our sinuses. We have our sinus drainage pathway, our opening called the ostium. It's ostia if we're talking about it bilaterally. And the whole complex is the osteomeatal complex. However, if our patient has some type of a mucosal thickening and we decide to do a sinus lift and bone graft, it is possible to lift up this mucosal thickening and block the sinus. And that can become an issue. In fact, the sinus can start to act like a pathological cavity in and of itself and start to enlarge in size and that's called a mucosal. And of course, we don't want that to be our fault. So if your patient has a mucosal thickening on that particular side and you're planning to do some type of augmentation procedure, very smart to go ahead and send them off to ENT to get that all cleaned out ahead of time. It does a couple of things that lets them know they already have this issue. It's not something that we caused. 
And number two, it cleans out the surgical area for you. Of course, when we move down to our mandible, our mandibular canal is what we are always concerned about when we are considering implant placement. And the canal has a mind of its own. It can do what it wants. It hasn't always read our textbooks. And so you can have bifurcations of the mandibular canal. Uh, sometimes you can have these little you know, bifurcations or trifurcations. You can have an anterior loop to the canal. Um, so it really can do, like I said, what it wants to do. And, and I think one of the nice things with this is we can easily trace that canal and avoid it. And unfortunately, this was a case that did not avoid the mandibular canal. And of course, that patient has neurosensory deficits. This becomes a liability and it's, it's a lawsuit. So we want to make sure that that's not us. And it doesn't have to be. With our 3D imaging, we can very easily avoid having that happen. The same thing with the mental foramen. You know, we always were taught in school you have one mental foramen, but that's not actually true. You can have two, you can have three. Um, these are all variations of normal. And so definitely we would want to trace those, know where they are before we place an implant in this particular area. And we have um, some little incisal branches from that mandibular canal that will come forward. And we know that it will come forward from that mental foramen region and it will um, either exit through our little lingual canals or here we see one that is exiting in the um, canine region. So again, our canals can do what they want. Definitely wanna be able to trace those and avoid them if possible. Now the lingual canal can have um, quite a variation as can any of our neurovasculature. So here we see two lingual canals. You might have one, you might have three, and those are all completely normal. We have our submandibular gland fossa region. We definitely want to avoid placing an implant through this area because we know that our lingual uh, neurovasculature uh, is coming through that area. We definitely don't want to impinge upon that and cause an issue. All right. So let's look at um, some of these cases. So this was a case performed without 3D imaging. Uh, based on the 2D imaging, it looks pretty good. It looks like our implant has osteointegrated. We know the majority of them do. But in looking at 3D, where is the implant really? And so we can see that we don't have any buckle bone holding this in. And the apex is sitting out in space. And so we just have a little bit of uh, palatal bone that is holding that implant in place. So certainly that is going to make a difference as far as the longevity of that implant. This was another one. Implant looks well positioned based on our 2D imaging. Looks like we could go ahead and restore that pretty nicely. But where is he actually located? So it's actually located um, lingual to the lingual cortical border. So in fact, there's not a lot of bone that's actually holding that implant in place. And so it's really not restorable. This is another case. Uh, this, these were measurements taken off of angled posterior maxillary PAs. And we know that the amount of bone that's measured is not actually the amount of bone that's there. And I'll give my little caveat with this. Um, in radiology, we see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so we have a very wide no judgment zone because we've all been there and we know that things can happen. Uh, this particular clinician is an excellent clinician. He's placed thousands of implants throughout his lifetime. He's a specialist. Um, certainly you wouldn't expect this, but just know that everybody can have bad days. And so he actually came running down to radiology and the comment was, I lost the implant. Well, guess what? We found it. In fact, there's a the little carrier on it as well. I mean, if you look close enough, that implant looks just as shocked as we do. So, you know, but it was, was a really bad day for the clinician. And this is a really bad day for the patient. And if we had 3D imaging, it wouldn't have happened or it might not have happened. So with our coming CT, we can really do so many things. We can plan our implant. Uh, we can merge it with a proposed restoration or study models or optical impressions. We can merge the CBCT data with CEREC using our CCAT. 
So here's an example of CAD CAM plus implant treatment planning. In fact, um, this software is so ridiculously easy. Uh, I mean, I have to let you know I'm a radiologist. I, I don't place implants myself. Um, I don't usually do the planning. I'll do the measuring. I'll do the tracings, that sort of stuff. But I was able to get on, play with this, and put this together exactly where I wanted it, the size that I wanted, the implant that I wanted, the location that I would want in less than five minutes. Um, super, super simple, intuitive software. I mean, literally, it walks you through step by step. And I think that's one of the most amazing things with um, all the dense ply Serona coming CTs is the Cydexis and CCAT software. It makes it so easy that even a radiologist could do it. So. One of the best reasons for a Cummings CT is to have a surgical guide. So this is definitely very, very important. It makes it so simple. It um, actually, they'll come with a recipe. It gives you step-by-step -step how to go through the implant placement um, process. And the surgical guides will actually be accurate to a certain degree. So it will come with a certificate of accuracy, um, which we have tested. And actually they're more accurate than even their certificate of accuracy will say. Uh, another reason why guided surgery is a great idea because just because we have a huge area to place this implant does not always mean we can place it where we want to. And of course, this was not the optimal position that that particular person had intended. All right, let's talk about endodontics because this is fantastic for endo. In fact, this is really what got me into 3D imaging was the endodontic applications. Uh, you know, there's nothing worse than having a patient that is in pain, you've already done the root canal treatment, you've already restored the tooth, and you can't see based on the 2D what's going on. And so, like I said, this is really what brought me into 3D imaging. Um, this is just, not only is the Comium CT amazing, but the software again. So this is the endo mode uh, through CCAT or CCAT endo. And again, it takes me two seconds, I can go down through, I can trace all of the canals, it will tell me what the working length is. Um, just really, really easy, intuitive, and user-friendly. Uh, I'm always concerned about, of course, our non-healing root canal treated teeth. And we did some research um, for my master's project was looking at 2D versus 3D with our non-healing root canal treated teeth. And we can see based on the 2D, we have a nice periapical lesion. Uh, we do have a large post, but doesn't seem like um, that's part of this, you know, really seems like it's more centered on the apex. But when we look at it in the 3D, we can see, no, we do have a J-shaped radial lucency. It goes right to the termination of that post. Let's just know we do have a root fracture. Now, we may not always see the fracture line, but we can see the evidence of the fracture. And as we get to higher and higher resolutions, we may start to see some of these fractures if they are displaced more than the resolution of your machine. So in the high resolution mode, it would be need to be displaced more than 80 microns. Um, but we can definitely see some cases here where the fracture is clearly evident. Um, here we have a significant fracture with a step defect. And of course, I think everybody can see that fracture line. So again, with our non-healing root canal treated teeth, things we are looking for, we're looking for an unfilled canal. Many times we will find an unfilled MB2 canal, especially on a maxillary for smaller. But we can see the fracture lines, as I said, if they are displaced more than the resolution that that particular volume was taken at. We can see external root resorption. Um, before we couldn't tell based on the 2D, really if we're looking at 2D versus 3D. I'm sorry, if we're looking at um, internal versus external when we're looking and comparing 2D versus 3D. But when we come to 3D, we are able to clearly see that, yes, we have external root resorption with this particular case. Um, this was another one with external root resorption. And this external root resorption was so huge, you could even see it in the volume rendering. And so it's really nice for the patient. You know, many times you tell the patient, well, you have external root resorption. They don't know what that is. They don't understand what happened. You can actually turn this around and show them exactly what's going on with their tooth. So it makes it easy for you, makes it easy for them to understand. Internal root resorption, again, this can be a little bit more difficult. And um, again, we're still looking at it based off of the 2D, trying to decide if we're looking at internal versus external. 
But with our 3D, we can start to see this granular enlargement of the pulp chamber and canal. And that lets us know that, yes, we do have internal root resorption going on. Uh, but this particular case, uh, this was a young individual who was having pain on this tooth. And you can start to see a little bit of widening of the periodontal ligament space from the CBCT. And we have a little fusiform enlargement of the canal. In fact, if I'm looking in the axial sections, I can compare one side to another. Now we know variations do exist. However, you can see that this side is obviously larger than the canal on the other side, and we can measure it. So we can measure it and we can say, yeah, definitely we've got a fusiform enlargement there. We have widening of the periodontal ligament space. It looks like we have some internal root resorption and we can go ahead and take care of it early on. Uh, this was a pediatric case. Uh, so this patient um, had already had a root canal treatment, was having a lot of pain and drainage coming from that lateral. Uh, of course, we have a hypoplastic tooth number nine. Uh, but tooth number 10 was having a lot of issues. And even after they did the root canal treatment, the patient continued to have problems. So they went ahead and moved to a uh, nice low dose uh, 3D and they could see that there is a secondary root on that lateral. Definitely not something we would have picked up from the 2D, it definitely took moving into 3D to be able to see what was going on with that tooth. Uh, this was a very interesting one. This came from an endodontist's office. And they were concerned about this lesion right here. So this is uh, tooth number seven, this is number eight, nine was evulsed years ago, and this is number 10. And their question is, do we need to retreat number eight or do we need to do endo treatment on tooth number seven? Now this patient is a 60 plus year old female. When we're looking in our comb beam CT, what do we see? We see a cleft palate. In fact, we can see this bony defect right here. This is what was being projected across and what was getting picked up on the 2D imaging. So we went ahead, we sent it back. We said, you know, cleft palate. She does not need to have endodontic treatment. The teeth were fine. And um, this is what I love about radiology. Radiology is just really the facts. So the endodontists end up calling back and saying, well, the patient says she doesn't have it. Doesn't have what? doesn't have the cleft palate. Well, it's the facts, ma'am. It is what it is. And so that's the beauty behind radiology. It tells you the truth. And uh, so I've never seen a patient want to have root canal treatment, but evidently she did. All right, new research does reinforce the need for early detection of apical periodontitis. Recent research has demonstrated connection between apical periodontitis and a greater risk for cardiovascular disease. I'm not really surprised anytime we have a chronic inflammatory process going on, um, as we found with perio, uh, we do have a cardiovascular risk or an increased cardiovascular risk. Now, the size of the lesion at the time of root canal treatment does determine success. So if it's a very, very large lesion, there's less chance for a successful treatment than if it's a small lesion. <clears throat> so being able to pick it up early is very, very beneficial to us. All right. So here we can see we have um, a nice apical lesion on this tooth. Based off of the 2D, we couldn't tell exactly which tooth it was. But now we can see between the cortical borders and we can easily tell, yes, we have a periapical lesion going on. We've lost the inferior cortical border of the sinus of that, on that side. And we have a localized mucosal thickening that is odontogenic in origin. And again, we're able to see between those cortical borders where before we could not. And that was the reason that we could not see some of these lesions in our 2D images. All right, let's move to some of our orthodontic applications. Um, definitely with the large field of view axios, we could easily see all of the anatomy that we wanna see to be able to do any of our orthodontic tracings. Um, from the CBCT, you can create the lateral CEF. So this comes from the CBCT data, and I think you can do a PASF as well, but you could also get the uh, additional CEF arm to put on it. And those are some of the images I showed in the beginning that were pretty phenomenal as well. Uh, this is great for um, impactions, looking at location and orientation of the teeth, morphology, relationships with other teeth, and looking, of course, at the location of those teeth with the surrounding anatomy. So obviously we easily can tell where an impaction is located. 
um, to know if uh, we'd like to go in after that. So no surprises, whether it's buccal or lingual, that's pretty easy. Although I think that, you know, most of us could try to figure that out, but it becomes more complicated when we have, you know, more impacted teeth. Identification of ankylosed teeth, very easy to tell now. Um, this particular tooth, they thought they could go ahead, uncover it and bring it down into alignment. And in fact, there's no periodontal ligament space. So this tooth is actually fused with the palatal bone, which will change the treatment for that case. We can see the location of supernumerary teeth. Um, anytime we have our little mesiodens, they like to kind of swim upstream. They're super cute that way. Um, and sometimes they have erupted into the nasal cavity. So, you know, if you're gonna extract that tooth, I'm sure you're gonna go for the internasal approach that you learned in dental school. We can also determine the apical status of some of these teeth. We know that there is multiple idiopathic apical resorption. Uh, this is several cases of it, and it might have a familial origin. That is what the research is showing us. Uh, definitely something that you would want to know before placing brackets on this patient. You definitely don't want them coming back and saying that this is your fault. So uh, nice to pick this up early. It's great for treatment planning. So this uh, particular case had a facially placed canine. They thought it would take about nine months to correct uh, this malposition. Looking at the panoramic images, it looked like, yes, that, that would be correct. And yet with our CBCT, we can see, no, the tooth is actually um, placed buckly with really minimal to no buckle bone. And really just a little bit of palatal bone remaining on that particular tooth. So that's gonna change the treatment plan. It's great for placing temporary anchorage devices, determining what the location is we'd like to place those and placing them appropriately. There's nothing worse for any of us, I think, than to have a young patient that has a temporary anchorage device going through tooth structure. So definitely we can visualize where that's going to go. We can plan it appropriately and make sure we avoid any of that pertinent anatomy. And of course, anytime that we are, um, you know, placing braces or we're doing orthodontics, anything with the manipulation of the occlusion, we wanna look at the temporal mandibular joints. So definitely something that we wanna look at. We use something called the research diagnostic criteria for determining if the patient does have osteoarthritic changes. And one of the things we wanna look for is this nice cortical border, nice intact cortical border. But one of the things we do want to pay attention to is that cortical border is not fully ossified until an individual is between the ages of 21 to 22 years of age. So if you are imaging a younger individual, say maybe you know 16, 17, 18, and they don't have the cortical border that you can see, it does not mean it's not there. It just means it's not fully ossified and we're not able to visualize it in our scans. So definitely I would say that's very important to keep in mind when doing orthodontic treatment. We do have a third-party software. So with all of these um, CBCTs, there's something called DICOM, that is Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine and Dentistry. And it's a detailed specification standard for formatting and exchanging those images and associated information. So anything that comes out of this machine, anything that you export out can go into literally thousands of different types of software. So some people will look at, you know, they'll say, well, dense plastron has a closed system. Well, I personally don't even know what that means because you can easily export out the DICOMs and you can put it into literally any software to do anything that you want to do. So if the software doesn't have a capability that you're interested in, no worries, you can still use anything else that's out there. So this is Dolphin. So you can go ahead and place your points and it'll automatically trace it. Um, but like I said, there's a whole host of software. Um, we can also use this, of course, if we want to move beyond uh, just some of our basic ortho, if we're interested in orthognathic surgery cases, definitely can do that with this particular machine. Um, in fact, you can plan your virtual surgery ahead of time and make your final stint based on where you want uh, the jaws to be located. And it can completely do an entire virtual surgery. Um, 
for your patient and show them exactly how things are going to look ahead of time. And again, you have your final stint, you walk into the OR, you already know exactly where everything's gonna move and be located, and it decreases the amount of OR time for that patient, and it helps with um, the healing time. All right, moving on to sleep apnea. So this is a huge area. Uh, we know that having obstructive sleep apnea or any type of um, breathing issues can really affect our patients. Um, whether this is, you know, increasing um, our heart rate, um, um, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, increased risk for sudden death. Um, with kids, we tend to see more issues such as ADHD. Um, they do more poorly in school when they aren't breathing correctly, they're not sleeping correctly. Um, it can just impact the everyday life of our patients. So being able to pick up a limited airway space is very, very important. Now, of course, with Coming CT, we are not diagnosing obstructive sleep apnea. We're just letting the patient know they have a limited airway space. Um, we can definitely do this very, very easily with the CCAT air. And of course, this is our Axios with our airway space. Um, this opens us up just to that great conversation with the patient. Hey, you know, what's, what's going on in your life? You know, you do have a limited airway space. You know, do you have some other symptoms going on with that? You know, can you show Mrs. Jones, ah, it's just really, really narrow airway space. Um, but again, this really helps to open those conversations for us. And again, the software is super, super easy. In fact, the software is really quite amazing. If, um, you know, we have lots of software at our disposal as radiologists, uh, we can segment the airway space and lots of different things, but we find time and time again that the CCAT Air is able to segment literally anything. Um, so, you know, if nothing else is gonna segment it, I always know my CCAT Air will segment it. So it's actually my favorite airway software for segmenting the airway. Um, but again, we have the limited airway space. Uh, we can tell Mrs. Jones, hey, you know, it's cross-sectional area lower, is lower than 100 millimeters square, and this lets us know that it is limited, and we can talk to her about it. In fact, we can go ahead and measure our airway space as well. So there are certain guidelines we can go off of if we need to go a little bit old school as well. We can also take into account the temporomandibular joints, which is fantastic because we know there is a significant association between obstructive sleep apnea symptoms and TMD. And the theory behind that being that we may have positioned the patient incorrectly with our two-piece adjustable therapeutic appliance. You might need to readjust it to make sure that those condyles are in a condylar conformative position so the patient does not end up with temporomandibular joint disorder. Um, now, radiographically, we can start to see any changes within the condyle within about six months. If you wait to see it clinically, it can take up to three years. And by that time, there's quite a lot of damage on the condyle. So I would always recommend following up. Uh, way back when I used to place these when I was a general dentist, I had no idea clearly what I was doing. Um, I did not check the condyles, uh, but now we know better. And so definitely that's something that I would follow up with and uh, make sure that the patient isn't having any um, pain or sensitivity in the condylar region. Now there's, of course, the whole anatomy of the airway space. We can actually look for physical obstructions. And of course, we could go down through all of the anatomy, but for the sake of time, um, we're going to go quite quickly through this. So in our nasal cavity, we have potential for actual obstructions in many different ways. Now we can see some changes in the inferior turbinates. And uh, you'll notice that the side looks larger than that side. That's a variation of normal. Uh, that's called the normal diurnal variation. If we were to look at this patient later on in at another time point, we might see that this turbinate is larger than that side. Uh, we can also have deviated nasal septums, which can, can cause obstruction. Uh, the patient might have a conchabulosa. This patient has bilateral conchabulosa. Now, this is actually a variation of normal. Uh, we just have pneumatization of that middle turbinate but it can decrease that osteomedial complex a little bit. So some, some people say it may be associated with sinus issues. You can also have hyperplasia of the terminate. So you can see how large that terminate is in comparison. Definitely we have a hyperplastic terminate going on. Uh, we can also have nasal polyps. Um, we might have, this one is a mucosal. 
So you can see we do have some expansion and remodeling of those cortical borders because we have a chronic stagnant mucus. And we can have some actual true polypoid pathologies where we definitely need to send this off to ENT to be looked at and have that evaluated. The patient is definitely gonna have some issues with breathing. We can look at the uh, maxillary sinuses. So you can have an acute rhinosinusitis um, where you have lots of little air bubbles telling you that you have active secretions, or we can have a chronic rhinosinusitis. And here we have thickening and sclerosis of the cortical borders. The body is laying down additional bone, trying to wall off that infection. And that lets us know, yeah, we have a chronic inflammatory process or a chronic rhinosinusitis. So definitely wanna send that to ENT. We can have enlarged tonsils as well. So especially with uh, kids, we might see enlarged adenoids or we might have enlarged palatine tonsils. Definitely that will restrict the airway. And we also can have enlargement of the lingual tonsils. In fact, even in kids that have had their tonsils removed, we can have a compensatory enlargement of the lingual tonsils that's trying to make up for the fact those tonsils are missing. And so it will enlarge and that will cause an obstruction. So we definitely wanna go down through all of these, make sure that we don't have some anatomical impingement that's resulting in obstruction of that airway space. And of course, again, we can have pathologies anywhere throughout the airway space um, that will be impinging on the airway. And of course, again, this would need to be referred to ENT to be taken care of. We also know that the skeletal classification is going to make a difference. So if we have our class two patients, we know that they're at increased risk for um, a limited airway space. So definitely the skeletal classification makes a difference. All right, I know that was a whole lot of information. Um, this is one of radiologists. That's a radiologist photo bomb right there. So, hey. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for putting uh, up with uh, my geeky little <laughs> questions. That was wonderful information and a lot of interest, certainly with the questions and answers. One thing I do want to relate to you, um, uh, the whole group, because I know you have a large following throughout. And as you mentioned, everybody's been anticipating the Axios. I want to make everybody aware that uh, very shortly, in fact, November 13th to 20th, the virtual DS world is happening. And Dr. Colt Farber is one of the presenters there. So there's over 70 hours of dentistry being uh, given to you with DS World 2020. And in fact, if you reach out to your Henry Schein representative, uh, they can sign you up complimentary to all of that access, including uh, four uh, groups or tracks. If you're new to CAD CAM, experienced in CAD CAM, new to 3D, or uh, already have 3D and you want to look at upgrades. So please remember to reach out to your Henry Schein representative and get complimentary access for that entire week of over 70 videos. And if you wanted CE, there's over 50 CEs available for only $99 with that fast pass. So with that, uh, Dr. Cole Farber, I wanna thank you very much and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but we started just a wee bit late. So I wanna go over some of these questions uh, that we had as well. Well, and I want to clarify something too. I think I said yes. in the beginning, I want to make sure that you realize that Axios has dedicated detectors for PAN, CEPH, and CBCT. So I think I said that a little bit incorrectly in the beginning. I was rushing. So I want to make sure that yeah. I point that out. That's one of the things that makes it so special. Yeah, great. And that was one of the questions. A person had um, a Galileos and wanted to know what are the points or the benefits of going to the Axios at this time? Oh, that's a great question. Um, actually, there's quite a bit. And again, as I said, it has the dedicated detectors for um, each of the different uh, modalities. Um, but another one, of course, is that you would have the variable fields of view, which I personally love. I like to be able to say, you know, I only need the max or the mandible at this time. Or, you know, maybe I'd like to take a larger field of view. Maybe I do need the condyles. Um, so being able to vary your field of view is fantastic. Being able to vary the image resolution as well that goes along with those particular sizes um, is definitely a huge plus. And I think being able, you know, if you're really into endo, being able to do that five by five endo mode, especially if you're looking at a non-healing root canal treated tooth, very, very beneficial to be able to see what's actually going on. So I think that, that having the variability is huge. 
Um, but there's a lot of other features to it. As I said, you know, the pan is really amazing in the panoramics that it takes. And I don't think the, the Galileos can't take a separate pan by itself. So um, you could just use it for a pan if you wanted to, if you have, um, you know, younger patients, especially. And um, it has a patient positioning um, assistant as well. I think they call it, you know, PIA. And so you can actually put in, you know, the size of your patient and whatever, and it will go ahead and give you or move to where it's supposed to go, which will be a time saver, especially, you know, anytime you can become more efficient is very, very helpful. So there is a lot of pluses to moving yeah. from a Gallius. A to lot that. more variability and options to do much more. Exactly. Right? Great. Uh, one of the things we know early on, uh, some of the recommendations was to hold back in the pandemic from taking intraoral radiographs. So I think we have two questions that really point on that. Can you get bite wing images from the panoramic? And can you diagnose dental caries? That's a great question. Um, you can take the panoramic bite wings. They do have that. Um, I think that with um, any panoramic, you're still looking at about, you know, 2.5 line pairs per millimeter. So it's not going to give you the intraoral resolution. It's going to look, um, you know, I would say better than our older pans, especially as it's able to go through and find exactly where that perfect focal spot is for you. But you do still have a panoramic geometry that you're dealing with. However, especially with COVID right now, you know, being able to take the panoramic bite wings and a comium CT is huge. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I mean, I think that that will be replacing uh, some of our full mouth series for a while because we want to do things more extra orally. Uh, bottom line, what we usually recommend, um, you know, when people are saying, well, what, what is the full mouth series of the future? would probably be a comium CT and for intraoral bite wings because then we have really nice resolution with that as well. But you certainly can take the uh, panoramic bite wings with this. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions right up front, because I know there's a sensitivity as you go through the anatomy that we may have forgotten about the liability of reading some of the radiographs. So one of the questions was, does a board certified radiologist have to interpret the images taken? That's a great question. Um, and we, I think there's a lot of maybe misinformation that's out there as well. The right now, the ethical and uh, the ethical thing to do, and what we are legally liable for as dentists taking any image, whether it is you know a bite wing to a ceph to a comium CT, is to evaluate the entire image. The entire image needs to be looked at. And so if that is a Comium CT, the entire Comium CT should be looked at. I think one of the really nice things with what Densply Serona offers and Henry Schein as well as Patterson, what everybody offers is that you can go to CEREC doctors if you purchase this technology and take free courses. And I would definitely recommend taking additional courses. With any technology, you always wanna take additional courses and understand how it works. And this is no different. Um, they're going to show you how to um, reorient the patient, how to use symmetry to go down through. Even if you don't remember all of that anatomy, you can look from the right side to the left side and say, ah, that looks exactly the same. It's perfectly fine. Or you say, no, there's something going on. And at that point, if you're going through and something doesn't look right, that is when it's your legal um, liability to send it on. So what we usually find is that especially new clinicians that are out, we might get a lot of cases in the beginning, but our reports are really thorough and will tell you exactly what you're looking at and exactly what you're concerned about. And you can learn through that as well. And so maybe, you know, in six, seven months, you're like, ah, I feel totally comfortable with, oh, I know what that is. And you won't need to send that off. So probably a long answer to short question, but <laughs> no, not everybody, need, not everyone yeah. needs to be sent to a radiologist. It's just, if you find something that you don't know what it is, you'll refer it just like you would if you found a difficult root canal tooth and you want to send that to the endodontist. Perfect. And you had mentioned the software already has the one touch button to send it off. Exactly. Right, so it's, it's already built in. It's super easy for you. Great. Uh, another question. Uh, can we get the airway view from the panoramic style image or does a cephalometric cephalometric style need to be taken? Um, so, the CCAT Air 
will uh, give you everything in 3D. Uh, you do need the 3D to be able to um, it fully evaluate the airway space. Um, and with that, it will automatically um, step you through that process and tell you how to trace it. You literally follow just the next buttons and then you're gonna get that, uh, what looks like a Ceph with the airway space, but it's actually the 3D image. So uh, you do need to have the full uh, airway space in all three planes to be able to accurately segment that. All right, and appreciation of everybody's time. We've got three great questions here that I just wanna finish up on. Uh, one person is referencing the AGD article that stated one in four patients walk through the office with an asymptomatic lesion. So the question is, should that be a screening tool? It's easier to find the C with the CBCT low dose. Do you recommend that being a screening tool with all patients? That's a great question. Um, as a radiologist, we always wanna be cognizant of dose um, as low as reasonably achievable. Um, but you know, with some of the low dose protocols as I showed you, it's the same as a pan. And so I think that having those extra tools at your fingertips are probably a really good idea. Um, and we do know, as, as I said, you know, at least one in four. Um, some of our, when we're looking at um, our incidental findings, we see that at least, you know, each scan will have three incidental findings per scan. Yeah. yeah. Wow, incredible. What is the acquisition time and the post acquisition processing times? Is it faster than previous cone beams? It's definitely faster than previous. I think it has improved just as long as our computers have improved over time. Um, so the acquisition time is probably, you know, three to five minutes at most. Okay. For, I'm, for the whole thing. Yeah, for reconstruction and that sort of thing. Okay. So um, the actual acquisition of the image for the large field of view is about 16.7 seconds. So that part's really, really fast. Um, but the and whole reconstruction time, I'd give about three to five minutes. Okay. And it, uh, it, it goes on to the next question then too. At the very beginning, you just said on the large scan, it takes two rotations. Is right. that stitching them together then in that total time? Or is it just refining the scan? So that's putting it, it's putting it all together. And so that's okay. automatically done for you. Um, I think that was one of the ingenious uh, proprietary designs that they came up with that helped them to win the Red Dot Award. It's actually pretty phenomenal to be able um, to put all of that together. So it's not something that you have to go in separately and stitch those parts together. It will all be reconstructed perfectly for you. Okay, and that's only applicable on the largest scan, correct? That's or on the largest. Two rotations, okay. Right. Yeah. And final question, uh, is there movement stabilization with the Axios? I don't know if you meant oh, physically question. or software-wise. I don't believe that they have a, um, a motion reduction. They have okay. metal artifact reduction. Um, and I think that with some of the patient positioning help, that assistant that you have, um, that will help to decrease the motion as well but I'm not sure if they actually have a motion reduction software on it. Okay, great. That's all the questions for tonight. I just wanna mention again that uh, everybody that's commenting how uh, beneficial this has been can gain another hour with you uh, through some of the programs next or in a couple of weeks with um, DS World. We appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, I, as I wanted to mention, we're going to rec we are recording this, so it'll be sent out to you with an email uh, next week. If you have any questions or concerns or topics that you want us to pass along either to Dr. Colt Farber or to give to Henry Schein, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. With that, I want to thank you all for your attendance. Dr. Colt Farber, thank you for the wealth of information. And we thank certainly you. look forward to the next time we get to hear from you. Thank you for attending. Everybody have a beautiful night.